Welcome, everyone. We're ready to start our program. Thank you all very much for coming out on a, uh, a nice rainy night, although at least the temperatures are warming up and it's supposed to keep getting better every day until a glorious Mother's Day, which is coming up. So happy Mother's Day early to all the mothers here with us and watching the live stream uh, with us today. My name is Jim Lakely. I am the Communications Director here at the Heartland Institute. I want to tell you just a little bit about uh, Heartland, and there's going to be someone else coming up to the stage to tell you just a little bit more about Heartland before we uh, begin our program. We were founded in 1984 by a group of individuals who met regularly to discuss uh, the value of free markets and individual liberty, uh, and the need to promote these ideas to the general public, but not from Washington, D.C., or New York, or, or uh, on the coast, but right here in the Heartland. Thus, our, our name, the Heartland Institute. Uh, we're a think tank. We're in the ideas business. And one could argue that uh, there's been no greater idea in the last 250 years than those put forth by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, which we have a library here. We have a copy of that as well if you'd like to check that out. Uh, but Adam Smith put forth the view uh, and positive observations about the value of free markets and how they work to better the human and economic condition. Uh, we're still living in Smith's world today, or we should be, maybe living better in it. And our guest tonight uh, will argue uh, right here in the Andrew Breitbart, C Andrew Breitbart Freedom Center those very points. Uh, if you like what you uh, see and hear tonight here in the Andrew Breitbart Freedom Center or watching online, uh, the live stream, welcome. Uh, I encourage you to look around at heartland.org, our website. Uh, you can check out our blog, The Freedom Pub, which is updated many times every single day on the news of the day. You can check out our daily podcasts on iTunes. Uh, we're on pace for about 1.8 to maybe as many as 2 million downloads and listens to our podcasts this year. So we're very excited about that. And if you listen to it yourself, I think you'll also become a fan. Uh, you can also check out our YouTube page where this presentation will be automatically archived so you can view it uh, at, at your leisure and share it with friends uh, so that they can check it out as well. I think there's a lot about the Harlan Institute that you will find uh, that is right up your alley, something that you really like. And there are boxes on your tables and there are places you can click at heartland.org where you can join us and join the fight for freedom and liberty and help support the great work that all of us here at Heartland do every day uh, to fight for those principles. Uh, and with that, to talk just a little bit more about another aspect of the Heartland Institute, our Government Relations Department is Government Relations Manager Lindsay Stroud. Thank you, Jim. Hope everybody's doing well. I'm Lindsay Stratton with the Government Relations Department. And what we do is we communicate um, with legislators and we research policy, which includes uh, legislation tracking for all 50 state legislators. Um, we consist of our director, John Nothter, um, our senior policy analyst, Matthew Glanz, and policy analyst, Tim Benson. So to show what we did, I'm just going to uh, say what we did in our first quarter. We have uh, published 67 research and commentaries. Um, I call them Heartland's own mini research paper, and we send them to the state legislator. And um, they're just probably about 700 words regarding, test, uh, regarding legislation that's been introduced in respective states. Um, we've also provided testimony for um, eight different times in seven different states. And what we do is pretty effective, as a 2016 survey had, uh, that we conducted last year of uh, 503 randomly selected state and local elected officials. 82% um, surveyed had read one or more of Heartland's um, newspapers, sometimes or always. 43% um, considered Heartland to be very or somewhat uh, valuable source of information. And 45% uh, reported a Heartland publication, quote, influenced my opinion or led to change on public policy. And with that being said, we're always here to assist you. If you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to get a hold of me, all right? Thank you. All right, thank you, Lindsay. My name is Joe Bast. I'm the president of the Heartland Institute. I am the husband of Diane Bast, who is sitting right back there. Um, on your table is a how did we do form. I hope you all take a look at that and over the course of this evening be thinking about how you're going to answer this. One of the questions is how would you rate the presenters? Now I automatically get an excellent, but Bob Janetsky <laughs> has to earn it from you guys. So, so pay attention to the presentation and give him a, an honest score. There's also a flyer for upcoming events and I see um, Bob is the last ugly speaker that we have on the program. 
We have beautiful women on May 24th and another beautiful woman on June 21st. So don't miss those upcoming events. Um, I started the Heartland Institute in 1984, 33 years ago. In the first month or two of the organization's existence, I got an op-ed piece published in the Chicago Tribune. The piece was about how Illinois should cut taxes in order to encourage economic growth and attract new businesses to the state. I got a telephone call from a guy who was the chief economist for Harris Bank. He was probably the best known, most respected economist in Chicago. He was on TV all the time. He was a real celebrity. And he said, I saw your op-ed piece. We need to talk. Come to the executive dining hall at this big fancy downtown bank, and we're going to talk. And that was Bob Janetsky. And I show up. You know, I'm all of 26 years old. Um, Bob's assistant, Brian Westbury, was there. Some of you probably recognize Brian went on to do great things and good things. At the time, Brian was even younger than me. I guess he still is. Uh, <laughs> but he sure looked really young, and uh, he was very quiet during this meeting. And Bob Janetsky took time out of his busy day to take pity on this kid who's trying to start a little libertarian think tank and taught me everything I know about taxes and economic growth. Bob Janetsky did pioneering research on the relationship between taxes and economic growth, something that others didn't bother to do. He was looking at state taxes and state economic growth rates and seeing if there was a correlation and then change in tax rates versus economic growth and, and writing it up. It was really good research. Even before 1984, Bob Janetsky was doing great work. Um, back in 1977, he wrote a book. The old, the old farts in the room will remember Beryl Sprinkle. There it is, Bob. 1977, Winning with Money, A Guide for Your Future. Beryl Sprinkle and Bob Janetsky. That was 1977. In 1986, he wrote Taking the Voodoo Out of Economics. Okay, this is a really popular book. This had some real impact. It was during the Reagan years. Um, Bush Sr. had accused Reagan of voodoo economics, and Bob Janetsky came to the defense of supply-side economics. In 1997, he wrote A Nation of Millionaires, Unleashing America's Economic Potential. And Heartland worked really closely with Bob on this. This was my first chance to, to really work with him as a writer a important book that was way ahead of its time, talked about how every person in this room could retire as a millionaire if we just adopted 10 public policy changes. Um, and he worked through how much each person would benefit personally from these changes in public policy. It was good breakthrough stuff. And finally, in 2011, Bob wrote another book, Classical Economic Principles and the Wealth of Nations. Really nice book. and. Today, we're here to discuss his most recent book, Rich Nation, Poor Nation, Why Some Nations Prosper While Others Fail. Uh, an important book on an important topic, especially in our current political situation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Robert Janetsky. Thank you, John. All right. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, you're still younger than I am. First of all, I want to thank Joe Bass, I want to thank the Heartland Institute, uh, and I want to thank all of you for being here today and for anyone who's watching this. Uh, I, I, this is an important topic. Uh, a lot of people think that economics is boring. Um, they look upon it as a terribly boring subject. I don't agree. I believe economics is fascinating. I mean, economics is what determines living standards. And I often wondered, you know, why was I so concerned about living standards? And I, somehow it seems to me that I could trace the origins back to discussions that I used to have with my grandmother when I was a teenager. She would tell me about what life was like when she was a young lady. She was a young lady in the eastern Ukraine at the beginning of the 1900s. And when she would tell me about the conditions there, she would explain how poor they were, and her whole demeanor changed. She became sad when she thought about how difficult it was to find work. Many times she often had to work 
a walk, five miles, six miles, whatever. And she said on the rare occasions when she was able to find some work, it was very poor, low pay. And then when she would tell me about coming to this country, she would brighten up. Her eyes would sparkle. And she said, you know, I could not believe what I found in this country. She said, I was able to get a job during the day. I was able to get a second job at night. And I had a third job on the weekend. She says, this was paradise. This was heaven, at least compared to what she had known. Now, I tried to calculate, as a result of a lot of the data I did for rich nation, poor nation, what was she paid? She didn't have any skills. She didn't know the language. She had the most menial job you can get. She made, I think, less than five cents an hour in the US. Now, five cents an hour went a lot further when she was getting that job. So I updated it to today's currency so we could relate to it. It was about 75 cents an hour. And I just thank God that we didn't have the, quote, benefit of a minimum wage in effect at that time because she would have been priced out of all three jobs and I believe the whole history of our family would have been very different. What well, was the story and the incidents of talking to my grandmother that made me think about the most important question in economics? Bar none. Why is it that some nations prosper and other nations fail? That's the most important question in economics. And if you ask economists this question, you basically get two types of answers. One type, economists will tell you, well, it's because of resources. If a country has a lot of resources, uh, or if it has a lot of innovators, people who are innovating and inventing things, and creating things. Or they say, you know, if any of these conditions don't exist, maybe government spending can really create prosperity in a country. Maybe if you invest in the right areas, the right inventions, you'll be able to get ahead. That's one answer that economists have given to this very important question. There was another answer, an answer that was given by the two most famous economists in history, Adam Smith and Milton Friedman. They said, Really, the key to the wealth of nations is giving people economic freedom and control over their lives. What do we mean by economic freedom? Well, Adam Smith said the government should be limited. Why limit the government? Because then most of the activity in the economy comes from the private sector. He said taxes should be low. That gives individuals the economic freedom to control most of their earnings from their hard-earned labor. Markets should be free to adjust so what we buy and the prices all reflect what individuals really want. And regulation should be minimal. This is the nature of economic freedom. And what Adam Smith said is, if you provide people with this economic freedom, you will have the greatest amount of goods and services produced for the greatest number of people. So I thought, if the two most famous economists in history were saying these things, maybe it would be a good idea to pay attention to what they were saying. And the interesting thing about both these economists is the way they were trying to persuade people about economic freedom. Adam Smith went, pointed out the conditions in America and the colonies and said, because these colonies have more freedom, one day they will grow and they will be more prosperous than the United Kingdom. And he said, but in Latin America where they don't have freedom, where you have oppression, he said that will not be uh, as, as strong. And Milton Friedman, uh, how many of you remember in 1980, Milton Friedman had a whole series called Free to Choose where he had videotapes. And as part of the research for my book, I went back to those videotapes. I saw what Friedman would do is he'd go to different countries and point to prosperity and say, this country is prosperous, say Japan, because they allow more freedom than another country, say India. And then he would have a discussion, a half hour discussion with people who had disagreed with him, people who thought that government was responsible. And they would come up and say, well, uh, Professor Friedman, 
Japan also has a lot of government intervention. And we think it's the government intervention that's causing the prosperity in Japan. So what was it? Well, there was a flaw. Using antidotes simply wasn't as powerful as trying to come up with an objective measure of economic freedom. And being the genius that he was, Milton Friedman knew that. He knew there was a flaw in trying to convince people. So he met with the Fraser Institute in Canada in the late, six, uh, late 1980s and into the 90s. They developed objective measures of economic freedom so they can compare one country's freedom to another and you can compare what was happening to economic freedom over time. And these measures have been around for a while now. In some cases, they've been around for about 45 years. And I thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to do a study that looked at all these measures of economic freedom over time and then looked at what was happening to living standards in the different countries? This could potentially be a really powerful contribution. Now, it isn't that economists haven't paid any attention to these measures of economic and they have, but you know what economists do? They write for other economists. They do a highly statistical study with a lot of data and a lot of things that no one understands, including the other economists. And so people still don't know what the relationship is. And I thought, wow, I want to I put together a relationship between these measures of economic freedom, both here in the United States and abroad, and see what happens to living standards below it so that everyone can clearly see what happens and what the relationship is. And then I thought, well, there's a problem here. I have a bias in the direction of economic freedom. I've written four books promoting the whole idea, explaining why, as Adam Smith and Milton Friedman said, that giving people economic freedom promotes prosperity. There's a problem when you have a bias and you want to start a research study. Because there's the tendency to just look at the data until, you know, torture it, torture it, until it finally screams, you're right, you're right, I should have known that all along. So one thing, if a study is going to be any good, you have to do, is you have to make sure that it's an honest, unbiased study. And so I had to ask myself, can you really do an unbiased study? And I told myself, yes. <laughs> And the reason I told myself and convinced myself I would be able to do it was, first of all, I believe that's the only sort of study that is worth doing in the first place. But secondly, there were a lot of things I did not know about the relationship between economic freedom and living standards. I talked about the concepts in all of my books. And that's what Friedman talked about. And that's what Adam Smith talked about. What I wanted to do was talk about the evidence what was the evidence? I didn't know the evidence. To what extent was economic freedom associated with higher living standards? To what extent was it not associated with higher living standards? Was it different in history as it is in the current period? Is it different for countries abroad than it is for our country? There were a host of unanswered questions that I lined up. And I said, I really want to know the answer to these questions. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to look closely at all the data. And here, I really lucked out because I had all these data on economic freedom that had been developed by the Fraser Institute and some by the Heritage Institute in Washington, DC. And then I had to st start to collect data on living standards in different countries. And here's where I really lucked out because there was a, a great, British economist by the name of Angus Madison, who had gone back and diligently tried to estimate and comparable data for living standards in all the countries of the world, going back to the birth of Christ. An unbelievable undertaking. And his book was available. You could actually get the book with all these data in it. So I had the data for all the countries that I needed. Now that data ended about 2000. But other researchers, hundreds of researchers, perhaps thousands, statisticians, researchers, picked up on his work and updated the numbers to the current period. So I had to put, had to make them all comparable, put them all together. Everything was finally done, and I had all the data. Now the next thing I had to do was put the data together in some sort of concrete form so that 
people can understand it. And I wanted to start um, really going back to the beginning of time, more, more closely, more accurately, the beginning of recorded history. I wanted to focus continually on what was the economic situation of the typical worker, the middle income, perhaps slightly lower income working individual. And I went back, and I couldn't go back past the birth of Christ, at least not <laughs> as far as uh, Madison's data were concerned. But I went back to ancient Egypt and started to research. What were people like? What was their living standard like in ancient Egypt? And then I knew that living standards hadn't increased from the birth of Christ up to the Middle Ages. So I already knew that. And then I went into a description of what people's living standards were like, the typical worker, in the Middle Ages. And lo and behold, I found they were no different in the Middle Ages than they had been in ancient Egypt. We had gone 4,000 years with no significant increase in living standards. And remember, there were a lot of innovations, a lot of inventions in this period. What does that tell me? That tells me that this idea that innovations and inventions is the key to increasing living standards was simply not true. So then what I had to do is I had to decide where do I want to start and I decided I would start looking at the US economy because what happened was uh, in the as you get to the end of the Middle Ages you finally start to see economic freedom beginning to appear in England certain parts of Europe and for the first time in recorded history you start to see some slight increases in people's living standards but then what happened is the United States country, our country, was created. A unique experiment. An experiment creating a country based on the assumption that people should have the maximum amount of freedom and control over their lives so long as they don't harm anyone else. This was a unique experiment. And what happens as a result of this unique experiment? People from all over the world get attracted to the United States. And lo and behold, within a little more than a century, the United States living standards pass those of the UK, fulfilling Adam Smith's bold prediction of what would eventually happen in the United States. What I did then is I picked up the study in 1900. I said, I'm going to go from 1900 to 2015. And I'm going to look at living standards in the United States. And I had to collect a vast amount of data. Most of our data goes back only to 1929 from the official government reports. You have to dig into historical data to go back a little further. But I felt that it was important for a couple of reasons. Because I wanted a long span of history. And there was an important question about the role of government. You know, we have had made great progress in terms of economic activity in the United States in that period of time. But that period of time was also marked by a tremendous increase in government spending. So an awful lot of people suggested that the increase in government spending was a key, played a key role in that increase in living standards. Well, I wanted to see if this was the case. And what I had to do is I had to come up with a measure of economic freedom because I wanted to look at the performance of the economy in different periods based on economic policies of freedom. Now we didn't have measures of economic freedom but I had to take the components that I felt were most relevant. So what I did is I took the characteristics of a free market period which I objectively set up ahead of time would be where federal spending is growing at a slower rate than spending in the rest of the economy. So the private sector is expanding. I said a period of economic freedom will be one where tax rates are low, or if they were high at the beginning of the period and they were declining, that would be a period when we move toward economic freedom. Or when free markets were allowed to be pretty much prevalent, or if the markets had been restrained when we were taking those restraints off, or if business and individuals were being regulated, we would be reducing the regulations. Those were the free market periods. I call that free market classical periods. But they were basically periods where we were moving 
in the direction of economic freedom. The opposite of those is when federal spending is increasing faster than spending in the rest of the economy. So the private sector is shrinking. When tax rates are rising, when there are more restraints being put on free markets, and where there are also more restraints being put on business. So that, now I had my criteria. I felt these were, this is what the progressive economic policy agenda is over here. And this is the policy, these are the policies that are uh, associated with economic freedom. So I had this, then I went back through history. And I started to lop off periods based on what was happening in the periods. And interestingly enough, I came up with five periods in our history which were dominated by the economic, by the move toward economic freedom, and five periods in history that were dominated by the progressive economic agenda when we were moving away from economic freedom. Uh, the five periods of economic freedom totaled only 50 years. The periods uh, when we were moving away totaled 52 years over this period. There were also 13 years, the World War II, Korean War periods, when we had dramatic changes associated with the war that I simply, simply argued were uh, ambivalent periods. Now, I was in for a couple of shocks when I put together my periods of economic policy performance and the data that I looked at. The first shock was when I looked at my criteria, I found out that all of these forces, all four, moved in the same direction. That is, when government spending was being cut, taxes were being reduced, regulations were being cut, and markets were being created that were freer than before, and vice versa. I thought I would have a very difficult time kind of delineating the policy periods, and that didn't occur. And th that was my first surprise. My second surprise dealt with what was happening to my measure of economic activity. Now, I, I have a lot of measures of economic activity. Most of the results are in the appendix. But what I focused on primarily in the uh, main part of the book was the wages of the typical worker, the average wages of a typical worker. And my best estimate for that was the take-home pay of the average worker. Uh, I felt that that was really going to be characteristic of what this uh, middle income, maybe lower income worker was experiencing during these cycles. And the shock that really struck me was when I added up all the increases in wages. And there were a lot of them. Um, for example, for the whole period, the period in 1900, I found this fascinating, the annual wage after taxes of an average wage worker was $400. Now, again, we had a lot of inflation. So I had to adjust the wages. And the wages adjusted for t inflation, so you can see it in today's dollars, $11,600 was the annual wage for a typical worker after taxes. In 2015, it's $38,000, a 230% increase real wages, that's about a 1% a year increase in after-tax wages over history. Now that wasn't the shock. The shock was when I added up all the wage increases in the 52 years that we were following the progressive economic agenda, the total increase was zero. That was the shock. I, at that point, I sat back and I said, something's wrong. And I had, to go, I, I had to take a break, go back, look at the data. I knew that progressive economic policies were not good. I, I knew that from theory. I knew that from experience. I did not realize that it was that bad. So I went back, redid the data read again and again, trying to find out is this, and it kept coming out the same way. Turns out 87% of that huge increase in wages in the period from 1900 to 2015, came about during the periods characterized by economic freedom. And the remainder, the 13% that remains, all came about in that World War II, Korean War period when the policies were going in both directions, quickly changing from one to the other. So that was the most shocking development. And then, of course, when I got that shocking development, I couldn't help, couldn't help thinking, 
what I think most people should be thinking, what if, what if after that first period, uh, of, what if we had never experimented with the progressive economic agenda? That is, what if we never had the Wilson years, you, you never had the 1930 or 1940 period, what if we just had classical policies? And what I did, obviously hypothetical, I went to each period of progressive economic policies like 1913 to 1920 and I took the average wage performance in the previous period when the classical free market policies were in effect. And I simply generated a series to see, I, I'm just curious, what would our wages be today? The average after-tax wage today with that sort of analysis would be $114,000. That's the average take-home pay. Now, of course, we wouldn't have an income tax, so <laughs> no, everything changes. Um, and then what I did is I said, what if after that first progressive period from 1913 to 1920, we never returned to our classical roots? What would have happened? And so I did the exact opposite. From 1920 to 1929, instead of allowing the roaring 20s to occur, I simply took the average wage performance in the previous progressive period. And I continued to generate that throughout. If we forget about the World War II, Korean War years, what happens is in 2015, the average wage becomes $16,000, which incidentally was exactly what it was in 1913. That is, there is no increase in real wages. Now, I understand this is a hypothetical type of analysis. However, when I go through and analyze what's happening in the rest of the world, what is hypothetical for the US is reality in the rest of the world. When I look at the measures of economic freedom in my book, and I look at living standards, and I see in Latin America we have relatively low measures of economic freedom, according to the Frazier data. Latin American incomes are far lower than the US. And when you go to Africa and you see measures of economic freedom, they're about as low as you can imagine. What do you find? You find the lowest living standards there. And I started to look at one country after another country after another country, going through trying to research and analysis of what was happening to their economic policies at the time. And country after country, I start seeing the same relationship. And then I start looking at changes. Well, what happens when they change and they have a high rating and they go to a low rating of economic freedom? What happens to their living standards? Lo and behold, their living standards go up when they have a high rate of economic freedom to a low rate of economic the living standards go down. And you can see the problems that are occurring. So I'm looking at these data, and then I'm saying, okay, this is coming out too well, and remember you are supposed to be objective. So let me try and search and find where it doesn't work and try and figure out why it doesn't work. And there were a couple of countries where I thought I had discovered it's not working. And the more I looked at it, the more I went in and found out about those countries, and found out about where they were when they started to adopt policies of economic freedom, the more apparent it came that no, that was not an exception. The only exception I think I might have found is Jordan in the Middle East has a pretty high economic freedom rating and their living standards are not that great. But when you look at the environment, the chaos that surrounds Jordan, uh, yes, it is possible <laughs> that the relationship, you won't get prosperity if you're in the middle of a war zone and you have all that chaos going around. But that's about the only one I've found so far. I've done about 40 countries. I'll be doing the rest of the world because I believe you can learn more if you find something that doesn't work than from finding all these things that work because then you want to know why it didn't work. Well, let me... Um, wrap things up because I would like to get to uh, questions, but I, 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 as part of the conclusion, I want to make just a uh, kind of personal, personal observation. I, I went through mounds of data 
for this book. And, I, and very often I got consumed by the data, I got lost. And I just want to uh, recognize my wife, Maureen, who happens to be with us. <laughs> she, uh, she had to put up with this, and I don't know how many times she would come in after meeting with her friends and say, the most important question my friends had is, do I really have a husband? <laughs> and, or is he just the, some figment of your imagination? Well, uh, I think I'll wrap it up by saying, you know, what did this figment of her imagination <laughs> uh, end up accomplishing with, with all this work? And it didn't dawn on me at first, because again, I was enmeshed in the data. But as I kind of sat back and started looking at one chart after another, and one write-up of one chapter after another, I sat back and I said, wow, you know, what did I do? <laughs> I said, you know, I, I think what I did is to really verify, not that Adam Smith and Milton Friedman were correct, but the extent to which they were correct. And I don't know about them, and we can't ask them now, but for me, this relationship worked far better than I could ever have imagined. That is, they were far more correct than I would have ever given them credit for. I mean, this stuff was great. And got me to, to thinking, you know, we still have people who are advocating the progressive economic agenda. It's, it's really making a comeback. People are talking about increasing government spending in order to stimulate the economy, increasing it faster than spending in the rest of the economy. Uh, they're arguing against trickle-down economics, which incidentally has only worked and succeeded every time it's been tried in history. I mean, I mean there, there, there are people who are arguing for a minimum wage, a government-imposed minimum wage instead of allowing the economy to grow and for people to prosper. I mean, the progressive economic agenda is still alive and well. And frankly, I would say to anyone who is pursuing those economic policies, that what I'd like them to do is I'd really like them to look closely at the evidence in this book. Look closely at it. Go back, get your own numbers. The numbers are all readily available on economic freedom and living standards. If you want, I can help you with some calculations because there are a lot of difficult calculations. I'm more than happy to give you my data to see. They're out in the open for everyone to see. Because I guarantee you, if you look at this information, if you look at this evidence, you will come to the conclusion that I came to that when you promote policies that move away from economic freedom, what you are really promoting is poverty. And what you are really undermining is the economic condition of the middle class. So I have a, you know, that's my challenge to people. Now, for those of you, many in this room, uh, who agree with the concept of economic freedom, kind of knew instinctively that this was something that works. Uh, let me just say that I think it works to a far greater extent than I would ever have imagined. And what we have to do now, and I need your help for this, is we have to get the word out. We have to spread the word that there is solid evidence here. Solid evidence that really make, is going to make the difference between prosperity and poverty in some of the countries of the world. And if we can get that evidence out, I think that we can really change the world for the better. So what, what would I like you to do? I'd like you to read the book. I'd like you to become familiar with all the evidence that's in this book, because there's an awful lot of it, far more than I can talk about in a brief presentation. Um, I'd like you to go to libraries, uh, bookstores, request it. Just ask them to get it in. If you don't want to buy it, go to the library and read it off the library. Uh, Mention the book to others, to your friends and associates. Uh, 
I have uh, some people have told me that they bought multiple copies for the uh, their clients or for their employees. This is important information. We have to get the word out. If you can recommend someone look at this video to get an overview of this, uh, please do that. But I believe that uh, we are on the verge of making some very important decisions in this country that will affect our future. And countries around the world are always making the same decisions. And if they can understand the research and the evidence behind the power of economic freedom, they're going to make much better decisions than they otherwise would. Let me stop there and ask if there are any questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Bob. So if you have a question here uh, in the audience, uh, please raise your hand and somebody with a microphone will come over. Be sure to um, state your name so that uh, Bob knows to whom he is speaking. And if you're watching, uh, if you're online and watching on YouTube, uh, I'm watching the chat room on my phone and I'll be able to read your question for you. So we'll start right here with Anthony. Hi, I'm Anthony Ciani. Um, so uh, a few weeks ago I was listening to this uh, fellow, uh, Dave Ramsey. Uh, maybe you've ever heard of him. Sure. So. Um, and of course, he was relating about how wealthy people spend money and how poor people spend money. And the very next morning, I was uh, listening to the Dan Proft radio show, and uh, he was discussing how the Chicago Public School District spends money, which is to say they don't budget. If they budget, they don't adhere to their budget. And they spend money more or less willy-nilly, and, uh, and they spend money based on sort of the envy of what other people have done or what other school districts have done. And uh, and I kind of realized, wait a minute, they spend money like Dave Ramsey explains that poor people spend money. <laughs> and, uh, and I kind of thought, well, maybe if the Chicago Public Schools continues this behavior, then it doesn't matter how much tax dollars they receive because they will spend a lot of money and be poor. Yeah, and it's typical and, of other governments. So and uh, so I was, I was, Right, so I was kind of wondering if, if you've um, considered adding to your, uh, your list of four qualifiers for, for each of these, um, you know, what constitutes economic freedom and what constitutes uh, economic restraint, um, how, whether or not the government budgets and how well it adheres to the budget. Yeah, it, 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 there's a, a really good question in that. It's about the quality of government spending. And, and there is certainly some government spending that can be of higher quality than others. Uh, no, uh, that's very difficult. It's very subjective type of thing to get at from the economic data. You know, so that's why it's not included as one of the key pillars of economic freedom. But it's, it's very important if we could measure it, it's something that would be in there. So it's a really good point. Uh, thank you very much, uh, John, and thank you, Heartland, for the good work that you do. And I'm <clears throat> pleased that you referred to your wife. Uh, uh, I am, too. <laughs> uh, Bass has a very good wife, too. I know. <laughs> and I have a good wife for 62 years, so thank you. But I, um, <laughs> I, wanted, to, um, I wanted to refer to what you said about uh, Adam Smith. Um, I, I, mean, I, mean, I head a, a, a global group, and we make the case that moral proper capitalism came out of the Reformation, and we refer to um, Adam Smith, that he was actually better known as a philosopher, the book that he wrote on the theory of, of moral sentiments in that he states that we are all born with a moral sense. And then he goes on to say that um, <clears throat> uh, capitalism, um, uh, the understanding assumption is that we are all moral individuals and that we operate out of, of uh, uh, our uh, playing by the rules, the telling the truth and respecting others and so on. Uh, so what, do you, um, what are your thoughts about what I'm saying about uh, Adam Smith's uh, primary emphasis that proper moral capitalism is based on a moral foundation where we treat others with respect and re in, in a responsible way? I, I agree with Thank it you. entirely. The, uh, in my previous book where I talk more about the outgrowth of, uh, of economic principles, classical economic principles, Adam Smith's economic principles, uh, 
I believe, and not only do I believe, but the founders of this country believed that those basic moral principles came down from God, that God gave us those principles. Um, the, the idea of freedom. Didn't God give us all freedom? <laughs> I mean, the idea that we can make our own decisions, even though he knew some of them would be terrible. <laughs> uh, no, because he believed in freedom. He believed people should have freedom. And that was a basis for uh, Adam Smith's idea that this came from God and that uh, the system was a uh, system of economic freedom was really based on divine providence. Our founders thought that. That's how they put together a country that has been so incredibly successful. And as I pointed out today, the only times it has been unsuccessful have been those times when we went in a totally different direction. You know, the first, first, pardon? Uh, we this the period that uh, we're in now uh, started at least in in my calculation roughly about 2004 it did not start with president obama it started with a dramatic movement in the direction of more government spending more go more regulations and uh and it's still in effect it uh, if if i had to update the data to last year uh it would still be a progressive economic period and so far until things change in a more dramatic manner. Uh, we are perhaps at the beginning of a transition to a return to free market classical economics, but it's still touch and go. We still have an awful lot of people in Congress who don't seem to want to take the step back to the classical economic principles, the principles of economic freedom that uh, historically have been so successful. Thank you. We have a question over here. Please raise your hand if you'd like to be next. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, key yardstick you're using are average wage rates, comparing them to the degree of economic freedom in a society. Very hot button topic right now is wage disparity. Uh, how, how did your researches, uh, did they shine any light on the question of wage disparity? Yeah, one of the most um one of the most popular books in economics in recent years, um, and, and I gave the guy credit because he used some of this current data that I'm talking about, was called Capital in the 21st Century by a fellow named uh, Thomas Peckety. And uh, in his book, which I comment on in my book, his objective was equality of income. His objective wasn't growth and prosperity. It was equality of income. And I have a good friend who was telling me he was in Tanzania where he does an awful lot of work there. And the founder of Tanzania was a uh, extreme socialist, communist type of person. Uh, the economy is dirt poor. They've tried socialism. And he was talking to one businessman. And the businessman saying, yes, his, uh, his policies wanted everyone to be equal. He said, and we are now all equal. We're equally poor. There is no money for anyone. <laughs> uh, Tanzania is in you know, a bad economic condition. Uh, there are two objectives. You can either try for equality, and if you do, uh, you're very likely to get poverty, equal poverty for all. As a matter of fact, Peckety, for all the notoriety he got over his book, was praising how well the United States did from like 1913 uh, to the 1936-37 period. And I looked at that and I said, wait a minute, that was the middle of the Depression. <laughs> I said, the, the people on the bread lines could not have been grateful for the fact that all of a sudden there was more equality than there had been before. You cannot, you cannot make economic equality your objective without, if you really want to achieve it, also introducing poverty so that everyone is equally poor. So that, that's the only thing I would have to say. I did not look at equality for that reason. I think it's a false god, a false objective. People who work harder, who study harder, should get more and should be rewarded more. People who are smarter in their investments should become richer. Ball players who have better skills than others should be paid more. I mean, that's, the, that's human nature. And if you don't reward that human nature, if you try to somehow create your own system, you're not going to succeed. You're going to fail. Question over here. 
Hi there, my name is Veronica Harrison, Director of Marketing here at the Harlan Institute. Thank you so much for being here, Mr. Janetsky. Something that the infamous Henry Hazlitt taught us in his piece, Economics in One Lesson, is the art of economics is to not only think of the immediate effects of economics, but the long-term effects, and not only on one group of people, but tracing the impact of all people. Why does that not happen in America today? And what can we do as freedom fighters, so to speak, to make that a pattern in economics? I'm not sure I understand the question. Could you go and Absolutely. Again? So Henry Hazlitt's theme of his book, Economics in One Lesson, is not only focusing on the immediacy of a certain particular move, but actually tracing it throughout time. And also with that, not only focusing on one group of people, but all people. That does not seem to be the theme of American economics well, right now. I, I, Why I think, not? I think it was what I tried to do in my book, you know, when I, when I took it. I said, okay, the policies change. Here's the beginning of a, a, a period where policies change for either in the direction of freedom or away from freedom. What I then did is I tried to find the end of that period and measure what was the whole effect of the period on the average take home pay. Uh, of, a, of a worker. So that, to me, got all the subsequent factors that he's talking about here, and it affected more or, or less people. The details could be a little different. Uh, you know, a, as bad as wages were during the Depression, the government tried to artificially push them up with wage and price pre uh, uh, edicts to raise this wage, raise this, raise this price. And so, you really had some increase in wages, take home pay after uh, taxes during that period of the depression. But there were so many people unemployed as a result of those edicts to raise wages and prices that you ended up with 16% unemployment at the end of the period and no one knowing what to do. So that's kind of the extended effects on other people. A few people did get higher wages, just as if, you, if the government forces people to pay high minimum wage, there are a few people who will benefit from that. There are lots of other people, as they're finding out in San Francisco now, as all the restaurants are starting to close down because they can't afford to keep them open. There are a lot of other people who end up with no income because of that. But I, I, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's happening. We've had what I consider to be destructive economic policies. We've moved away from economic freedom. At the beginning of this decade, uh, at the right at the turn of the century, um, the Fraser Institute measured economic freedom and put us at number three in the world behind Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, now we are number 16 in the world. We have had a precipitous drop in our measure of economic freedom. And when you have that sort of drop, wages don't increase. Wages, wages are down. That's one thing that people have gotten correct. Uh, yeah, wages are down, and, and people know it, especially the after-tax wages. Uh, this is one of those bad periods that we've had bad policies. If the policies change, then we'll have another big test, but based on everything I've seen, if they change in the direction of economic freedom, the next period will be a heck of a lot better. Okay, we have a question over here. Hi, I'm Jim Johnston. Hey, I'm Jim. a recovering economist. <laughs> <coughs> And uh, I know you. <laughs> I, I, you got my number, okay. And you're good. I got your number too. <laughs> uh, you you have a career, part of your career at a at a bank locally, Harris Bank, as I remember. Right. And uh, could you comment about what in your study revealed about the behavior of the monetary authorities to uh, economic freedom and economic growth? Okay, uh, one of the decisions I made early on for the purposes of this book was to ignore short-term cyclical swings in the economy, uh, which are usually based on monetary factors. <laughs> and the reason I did that was, first of all, it introduced a huge additional layer of complexity from what I was trying to do. And, and, and it wasn't in line with what I was trying to do. I was trying to get longer-term trends. And not only did I look at policy periods, when policy changed, say, in the direction of 
free market classical principles. But I also looked at the stage of the business cycle at the beginning and the end. Because you can mislead people tremendously, and a lot of economists have, on both sides of the aisle. If you start a period with a very low unemployment rate, end a period with a very high unemployment rate, you can show tremendous statistics that show something that uh, may not be valid. So what I did is I tried whenever I could to adjust the periods so that we were looking at a long-term secular trend for that particular type of policy. And we were not misleading people as to what happened during that period. Uh, we could talk about monetary policy, but, but that's what I'm trying to say is that's another topic off the book, and I'd be more than happy to address anything. You know, you ask an economist something he thinks he knows about, and he's going to try and talk about it. But I, I, I don't know if that... Yeah. Well, there's two views around here. There's the extreme view of monetary policy and the moderate view. The extreme view is that the Federal Reserve should be abolished the buildings torn down, and the ground sown with salt. The moderate view is that it may not be necessary to sow the ground with salt, but the rest <laughs> of it's right. We have a question right over here. Yeah, hi, I'm David Pirenboom. Um, when I was in college, I, I'm an engineer by, by profession, and I always hated economics. But as I got <laughs> onto the working world and money became very important, you know, you're, you're trying to survive yourself, I got more interested in the subject. Now you mentioned Milton Friedman. I was very impressed and it was one of my first kind of entrees into economic sort of theory was the free to choose. And I still have a copy of the book and I remember watching the on WTTW or whatever the uh, <clears throat> that series and I was I was very impressed by Milton Friedman at the time. Later on I became aware aware of um, Austrian economics and um, of course von Mises and and so on. And I know there's quite a conflict from an, an economic level. Now they're both free marketeers for sure. They both believe in freedom essentially, and, and on that level, they're they're quite aligned. But on the economics level, they're quite at odds. I wonder if you have any comments. Now you could probably write yeah. a book about that, but <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, Thank you. the the Austrian school. Every time I read an Austrian economist, it seems to me they agree with all, as you said, the free market principles, the economic freedom. And I don't really see the conflict or, or a meaningful conflict. I know they, they talk about a lot about creative destruction and things like that, uh, which I don't think makes any sense. But, but I don't think it's, it's adverse to the uh, free market well, type of principles. You're talking about the monetarist versus the sort of classic. Well, explain to me, what, what's the Austrian monetary position? Well, of course, they believe in sound money. I think, I mean, well, specie back no, yeah, currency. I mean, classical, Adam Smith believed in sound money. You know, okay. he, I mean, he, he had, but, but he stated it very beautifully <laughs> in, in his text. But yeah. he was, a, no, he was as sound a money man as you can mm. be. Uh, well, I know that they are kind of pretty much philosophically at odds on an economic level, I, but I you don't people, see that? Well, no, I, I, I think okay. people come up with okay. arguments to argue, no. and that's okay. If they, <laughs> no, if they want to do that, that's, that, that's yeah. fine. For my part, whenever I've read it, I've never seen anything that oh. I thought was a major really conflict. Really in conflict. Okay. I mean, may, maybe minor okay. conflicts, but uh, that's for them to work out. Well. I, I didn't see anything in terms of Well, I'm just thing. an engineer, not an economist. That's why I asked. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we have a question with uh, Diane in the back. We had her hand up. You still wow. have a question, I hope. You, you noticed that? <laughs> of course. <Wow. laughs> master and master. Uh, two quick things. Um, first of all, how long did it take you to write the book? Because this sounds like a rather remarkably uh, challenging endeavor. And secondly, how do you manage to keep up your rather insane enthusiasm <laughs> for this topic? <laughs> your, your energy is fantastic. Well, thanks. I, I would say it took, what, three, four years? About three and a half years. Okay. Well, that's three to four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and the energy, I, I, I don't know. I, I attributed it in part uh, many years ago. My wife took me to a uh, Tai Chi lesson somewhere. And uh, for the past, what, 30 years, I've been doing Tai Chi, uh, which uh, I find very invigorating. So, 
Is that it? I don't know. <laughs> but I'm not going to stop. <laughs> and I just love, I love the subject. I, I love the concept of economic freedom. I love the importance of what the implications are. And I love it more than ever now because I never realized the extent to which the damage could be done when we moved away from economic freedom. I knew it wasn't going to be good, but I didn't anticipate that what I now anticipate. We would have been a third world nation. I mean, $16,000 for an average wage. We would have been the equivalent of Mexico today, if, if you allow for the hypotheticalness of that particular thing. And sure enough, some countries that never introduced economic freedom right down at the bottom. It's just a crime. It's really a crime against humanity. And the fact that there are people today advocating those policies, come on, wake up. You don't want to advocate poverty and undermining the health of the middle class. You don't want to do it. We have time for a few more questions. I have one myself, actually. Okay. Uh, you know, Rich, the book, Rich Nation, Poor Nation, it obviously compares a lot of countries around the world in there. It basically tells the historic economic story of so many nations yep. across, across the world. And so I wonder if you could share with us, as you looked at the, if you examine the economic history of so many countries, what country has the saddest story? Like, say they started off going on a pretty good direction and then turned around and made a mistake and, you know, you got to, economics is about human experience and so e a country's economic history is a story about humans and how they've lived. So what is, I guess we should probably have a positive part of this too, but what is the saddest story you read on economic history of a nation and what is you think the most hopeful and the best? Well, the, s the saddest was Ven Venezuela. Uh, I mean, they, they were uh, really blessed with enormous oil deposits. They were the richest country uh, in Latin America, the only country in Latin America uh, 30 years ago uh, that was above the world average in terms of income. But it was all because of oil. And instead of moving in a free market direction, they moved aggressively away from a free market direction. Now the people are starving, which you, you know, and they don't have toilet paper. That combination, I don't know, is just... <laughs> Not a good thing. You don't want that. You don't want that. So that, that's really bad. Another country that I, I really feel sorry for um, is Russia. I mean, the resources that Russia has are unbelievably enormous. I mean, as I went into trying to figure out the history of Russia, where it came from, my gosh, they always had a history of having enormous potential resources uh, and potential wealth because of all the resources they have. And they have just fouled it up time and time again. Uh, it, it's interesting that they talk about economic data. Some of the data, I, I took Russia back to, I think, the beginning of the, 19th, uh, the 20th century because I wanted a long-term look at what happened before communism, what happened after communism, and then what happened when communism collapsed and you can see it all in in their living standards and the really interesting thing is to look at the living standards during the communist period when they don't really look all that bad the problem is there's a lot of debate just as there is now about china as to are those figures really accurate if you don't have a market economy how do you value things all the stuff you're producing that's just people making an, an entry into an accounting book. You don't know if people really want that, if that's the price, if that's the right price. And we find out when the Soviet Union collapses because what you have is the measure of living standards once they're in a market economy just totally plummets. And then Russia was coming back, coming back, coming back. But then again, it's, it's power in Russia. It's the oligarchs, it's, it's the head who used to be the czar and it's now the head of Russia uh, who really make sure that they have all the power and the people don't. And so their economic freedom scores are not good. And then, of course, when you have a situation where the oil price <laughs> collapses, uh, you have just a misery in that economy. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like an unforced error they should be incredibly wealthy. That they should be very prosperous people. And they're not. But getting back to your issue, too, they don't have God. They don't believe in morality. That's not part of their culture. And when you don't have it, it's, it's very difficult to get back to capitalism.
Do you have? Is there a happy story? You tell me <laughs> there yeah, a good there story? Are, uh, the happiest story that I've seen. Uh, uh, you know, there are a lot of happy stories, such as Singapore and Hong Kong. Uh, those are the two world leaders in economic freedom. And I love the fact that uh, the people in those countries anxiously await every year's economic freedom score <laughs> to see who's one and who's two in the world. Because they're very proud of the fact that they, you know, they have economic freedom. And it, it also educates the people as to the importance of these particular measures. Um, Hong Kong's... Uh, Living standards today are on par with the U.S. And Singapore has living standards. Uh, uh, the U.S. is like $58,000 a year in terms of output per person on an international comparison basis. And Singapore's is $84,000. They far exceed the U.S. And there are some interesting developments that I talk about in my book that are happening in both Singapore and Hong Kong. But that's not the, the, the best story. The best story to me is the poor country that turns things around. And there's a country in Africa, you know, I mean, living standards in Latin America are here, living standards in Africa are here. If you think Latin America is poor, it doesn't compare to what you find in Africa. And there's poverty all over Africa. And when you look at the economic freedom scores, country after country, down, down low, and then all of a sudden you see one country relatively small country, five million people, Botswana in South Africa, that has, for the first time, its economic freedom score goes above the world average, right around the turn of the century. And lo and behold, you, you track their living standards, and 12 years later, the first African country in sub-Saharan Africa to have living standards above the world average. I mean, it, that's, that's the sort of beauty when you start to see countries that are terribly poor change their policies, adopt policies promoting economic freedom, letting free markets operate, and it's not instantaneous. This is not, I'm going to promise this is going to happen next year or the year after. It takes a number of years, but it gradually builds. And when they finally broke through above the world average, given where they were located, given the situation. Uh, to me, that was the most exciting success story of all the ones that I've tracked. I've spent a lot of time in the former Soviet Union, and I was there during the transition time between Soviet Union and Russia. There was a sharp difference. Russia believes in God. Soviet Union doesn't. There was a huge church that was destroyed by Stalin outside the Kremlin. It's back up. Boris Yeltsin started it going up. Putin is repairing churches all over the country. The Russian word for north is savior. And they're quite a religious people. I'm but very glad to hear that. <laughs> but Sabrosa in the communist time. I knew one person who both grandfathers were killed because they were Christian and uh, depending upon where in the country, etc., I had historians come and visit me because I was living there during a transition period and I was dealing with the people in general. There was a short period of time where all the books of the KGB were open for historians to read. A short period of time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. well, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. That's yeah, great. And, and as you say, they have rich natural resources, but a tremendous amount of corruption that <laughs> needs correction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have another question right behind. No. We got time for uh, one hi. or two more. Um, one of the uh, one of the factors that went into the economic freedom is um, is government spending. Uh, do you see uh, any any hope uh, that there's going to be some moderation uh, in in government spending, uh, either in the short term or in the, yeah, the long term? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of hope, uh, but I would be very cl evidence. careful. About evidence more than just hope. Uh, that, um, that is there going to be evidence? Uh, yeah, I think there will be evidence because what I'm going to do is broaden the measure of government spending because there's the government spending that's on the books of the federal government 
And then there's the spending, the indirect spending as a result of government regulations that have forced businesses to do things. Okay. The measure, the cost of regulations, the, and, and obviously it's, it's, a, it's a rough approximation, um, but I believe that's well over $2 trillion a year. That, that's a huge, huge cost to the federal government, uh, to the country, because if a government wants to accomplish something, it's one thing for them to just spend the money because they think this is a great public purpose. But if they then don't spend the money, but tell the businesses, you all have to spend this money to accomplish this purpose. It doesn't get reflected in the government books. And I think what President Trump has already started to do is to reduce that $2.2 trillion a year cost to the economy. So I believe that that's going to come down. I think that's going to be easier to get down than the government spending. Well, that was, uh, I think that was the fourth factor um, among uh, the, the, the factors that you had for economic uh, freedom was uh, uh, regulation. Yeah. So you separated the, those out. And yeah, you I did. And that there was always a correlation. The four of them were always uh, correlated with each other. Yeah. And that Whereas, are, are, you, are you saying Well, you asked about hope, and that's my hope. That if you're getting the regulations down, and if you're getting the taxes down, the history is that they all tend to go together. And it doesn't mean you have to cut government spending, at least by my criteria, which is somewhat arbitrary. All of me, I mean, it'd be great if you could cut it. In the 1920s, we did cut government spending. We cut government spending in half, major tax cuts. I mean, there was a whole basket of things, freer markets. It, it was incredible the way they all worked together. And that's been pretty much the history. It's, it's not perfect. I mean, we had tariffs back way back when instead of the income tax. So you, you always have to look at the magnitude of what we're looking at and those things. But uh, they do tend to go together. So you asked me if there's any hope. Yeah, I think if you have someone who's intent on cutting taxes and gets it done and cuts regulations uh, and, and allows free markets to operate, and that's also still up in the air, and um, then the, the slowdown in government spending uh, I believe is mo more more than likely going to occur as well. So it's just by again by looking at history, it might not occur in the first year; it may occur a couple of years out. And I think in terms of what the Congress is trying to do, they're trying to get to that point. We can't change things overnight, but maybe we can start to lay out the framework from which we can start to reduce some of this growth in government spending. Terrific. Um, Bob, I understand that you, um, that is all the time for questions we have right now. Uh, Bob, I understand, did you bring a gift for everyone here? Or uh, would you the, just the, the gift is my, if, I hope you didn't pay for it. <laughs> the gift is my, uh, the, my previous book, uh, Classical Economic Principles and the Wealth of Nations. So that should have been a gift. <laughs> if you paid $30 for uh, both the new book and the old, that was the gift. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Okay. And Bob will be available to uh, sign copies of uh, his latest book and his gifted book on the way out. Let's give uh, Bob Janeski a great round of applause. Again, I want to thank you all for being here tonight. Um, it was a pleasure to see you all, and um, I'm sure you enjoyed the program as much as we did. Uh, you'll see as uh, our President Joe Bass had mentioned, we have uh, reply cards where you can uh, tell us how we did because we really take those uh, surveys seriously so we can improve for next time. And you'll also see flyers for upcoming events at Heartland, and we hope to see you there. Thank you very much, and have a good night.